tonight, we're, we're going to go back to the rest of, of John. Yeah, we're, we're actually making pretty good headway in John. We're, we're not quite halfway done, but we're making good progress. We've been working through it, but it seems to have gone pretty fast. This passage in John chapter 15 describes a connection. There is a deep hunger in our hearts for a father. There is something about a father's love which is irreplaceable. Our heart longs for perfect love. And while we long for the perfect love of our father, our fathers, our, our human fathers, do the best they can, but they're not perfect. Some of us grew up in, in a, a secure, loving relationship with our Father. Others did not know our fathers. Others did not know their father. Um, some had a strained relationship with their earthly father. Yet that desire for a close, attached, secure relationship with the Father remains. I know of no greater illustration of what that secure, attached relationship with the Father looks like than this image of the vine and the branches. The relationship that we have with Jesus, God the Son, parallels the relationship Jesus had with his Father. As we read through the Gospel of John, and as we look at all of the references to Jesus' relationship with his, with his Father, and for that matter, the, the Spirit's relationship to the Son and to the Father, you see that there are these three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and yet they are one. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And we are to be in Christ, and we are to abide in God the Father. The Spirit is to abide in us, we are to be filled with the Spirit. There are rich statements throughout the Gospel of John, far more than we can process in a sermon, in a year, probably in a lifetime, to completely grasp what the fullness of God is. We will attempt to look at some of these expressions as provided for us in the Gospel of John. Before we get to the Gospel of John, though, what is the prayer that perhaps we pray as often as any prayer? Okay, the Our Father prayer often comes to mind. You know, I saw I saw a an article this week, and it talked about the expression of Jesus that can be used in a profane way. His name can be dishonored, or it can be the most honorable 
name that we call on. That is a prayer. If we say his name, asking for his help. But what about the Father? I had not thought about this, but some other things that I've read this week talked about how God the Father may actually be the forgotten person of the Godhead. And I'd never really thought about that. If we pray the Psalms a lot, it's impossible to forget about, about God the Father. But if you think about it, many people can relate to Jesus because he dwelt among us. He took on human form. He spoke our language. And we can relate to him. He's a person like us. And if you think about the idea of the Spirit, some can relate to him because well, we understand that, well, the Spirit lives within us, and He fills us, and therefore He is more relatable. But what about God the Father? There's something about God the Father which we can lose sight of who He is. He may seem distant. Mm -hmm. He may seem so separate and apart from us that we can't grasp who he is. When we hear things like the concept that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, we may have to wrestle with what that means. But for Jesus, the concept of God the Father was essential. And the Gospel of John spends much attention on this relationship that Jesus had with his Father. Let's start looking into this. Before we get into the Gospel of John, I do want us to look at the Lord's Prayer. God is good. Thank you. I, I heard a whisper all the time. God is good. Because God is good, we go to him in prayer. If God were bad, we might not want to go to him in prayer. Because people give out of their character. If, if we need something, we go to people who we think can provide what we're asking for. And if we're asking for good things, we go to a father whom we trust is good. And that whole father prayer, the Lord's prayer, is based on our trust that God is good. We pray our father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name. May your name be worshipped. May your name be honored. Why? Because God is good. We pray, thy kingdom come. Why do we pray thy kingdom come? Well, we want his kingdom to come because his kingdom is good. Amen. Where the kingdom of God is, is good. Where the kingdom of God is, there is good. Where he rules, where he reigns, there is good. Sin and death are no more. So we pray, thy kingdom come. We pray, thy will be done. Why? Because God's plans are good. We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because he has a plan. To redeem the earth and bring heaven and earth together. He has good plans. And he says, I, have, I know the plans I have for you. To give you a future and a hope. Plans that are good. We pray. 
pray, give us this day our daily bread with trust that God's deeds are good. We trust that God will provide us what is good, what we need, because he is good. We pray and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We can only pray that because we trust that God's heart is good. We trust that he will forgive us. He will not treat us as our sins might call for. We pray, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Why do we pray that? Well, we pray that because we trust that his path is good. We trust that he will lead us down a good path. Not into temptation, not into evil, but he will deliver us from that. He will rescue us from the evil path because God is good. Now, often the Lord's Prayer ends there. Typically, when we pray the prayer, we add the words, For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And that is a summary, affirming that God is good. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. God is in control as the king. God is able because he's powerful. God is eternal. He reigns forever. So thus, as we pray to our Father in heaven, he is the perfectly, he is the perfect heavenly Father. He is the Father we long for. And for those of you who are fathers, I trust, were you able to be the perfect Father, you would have been the perfect Father. But I trust that you did okay. You may have made some mistakes, but particularly those who are children of God have the Spirit of God within them. And God will work through even imperfect fathers. Well, let's look at the Gospel of John, shall we? Let's look for a short while at our Heavenly Father, and Jesus, the Son, and the relationship that exists between them. Let's start out with the first chapter of John. If, if you wish to have your Bibles, you may open to them. We're going to go very quickly through there, through, through some of these passages, and we won't be able to cover everything by any means. But... I am trusting that as we look through what John's gospel shares with us, it will help us honor our fathers, our, our heavenly father, and our earthly fathers even more. When we realize the essential role fathers play in our lives. First of all, is that Phrase from the prologue, John 1 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In many ways, that one verse may Summarize the entire message of the Gospel of John. If the purpose of John is to persuade us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that in believing we may have life in his name. This verse can summarize who Jesus is and where he came from. That he came from the Father. The Father sent his Son. And Jesus revealed the Father in a way that we could understand it. In the flesh, full of grace and truth. And this concept of glory, our perfectly heavenly, our perfect heavenly Father is so glorious with our earthly eyes, we would not be able to see him and live. And yet Jesus was able to reveal that glory in a way that we could understand it. So we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. With that as a foundational verse, I'm going to start going a little faster here on some of the characteristics of God the Father. First of all, John chapter 1, verse 18. The Father is close to his Son. Mm -hmm. The Gospel writer says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him That is the most recent New International Version translation of that verse. Wow. I wish I knew Greek a lot better to explain to you why it said, it said that. But let's just meditate on that for a while. Uh, some translators spent some time wrestling with that concept. So we ought to wrestle with it and then search the scriptures to see if it is true. Even as an earthly father longs to have a good relationship with his son, so God the Father is in a close relationship with the son. And Jesus, it says, is in closest relationship with the father and has made him known. In John chapter 2, The relationship that the Son has with the Father is revealed in his reaction um, to those who were making his Father's house into a market. The Father was so zealous, if not jealous, for the glory of the Father it says in verse 16 of chapter 2, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. In John chapter 3, the love of the father is shown. John chapter 3, let's go to... Verse 35, the father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The father loves the son. What else does the father do? In John chapter 5, we learn that the Father works. The Father works. John chapter 5, starting with verse 17. Jesus said, My Father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So the father works. 
As we look at all of these characteristics of God the Father, we can think about, hmm, well, what do our earthly fathers do? Well, the earth, our earthly fathers are providers. They work. Our earthly fathers love us. What else do we learn about that? An illustration of some of these characteristics that we have already looked about, of how the Father works, and the Father loves, and the Father reveals. They're amazing. They're an amazing number of things that God the Father does, which we will not be able to go into. The Father teaches. The Father reveals. The Father even amazes. He does things that are so glorious. We, we are in awe. The Father raises the dead. The Father gives life. The Father sends. Some of these are wrapped up in the concept or in, in the passage, the very rich passage that is in John chapter 5, uh, starting with verse Seven. I wrote over it. Hmm. John chapter 5, verse 19, where he says this. Listen to what Jesus reveals about the Father. Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Doesn't that sound like a Father? It's like the father teaches his son how to tie a tie. The father teaches the son how to shave. On that first day when he gets a little bit of peach fuzz, he says, here's what you do. Well, in a, in a far more divine and glorious way, the, the son sees what the father is doing. And the father, or, and, and the son does what he sees the father is doing. Why? For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Part of fatherhood is training and raising up your son. Jesus says, yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, so, even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So if the Father God can raise people to life, so the Son raises people to life. We learn that in uh, chapter 15, starting with verse 24, that, did I say 15? I meant 5. In chapter 5, sorry for throwing you off there, chapter 5, starting with verse 24, 24, we learn that the Father has life in himself. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and is now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son also to have life in himself. We humans are reliant upon others for life. God the Father and God the Son have life in their own selves. Mm -hmm. Skipping ahead to John chapter 6. The Father gives. The Father gives. Now, fathers may give an allowance. They may give gifts to their son. But the Father, Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 32, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And indeed, in verse 37, it says, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Do 
There are passages in John that talk about how God sends. There are passages that talk about how God draws people to Jesus. John describes how the Father teaches. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. As it is written in the prophet, they will all be taught by God. The Father gives life. The Father draws people to Jesus. The Father is greater than all. John chapter 10, verses 25 and following. In verse 29 of chapter 10, Jesus says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. When we think we are up against trials and difficulties, when we think we are up something beyond what we can imagine, when we think that the temptations of the evil one are too strong, we have to realize that God our Father is greater than all, and nothing can snatch us out of his hand as we put our trust in him. In chapter 12, there's an interesting verse, which if we applied it to an earthly father, it might seem a bit askew. But when we look at it from the standpoint of God the Father, it makes sense. And that is where the Father glorifies himself. If an earthly father were to glorify himself, we would think, hmm, his ego is too big. But listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 12. It says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me for, from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus came to that hour for that purpose, to give glory to God. And Jesus asked God that he would glorify his name. It says, then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Because God is who he says he is, because he is the great God of glory, and because when we worship God and honor him, we are glorifying his name, we are, God is in essence doing to himself what we are doing to him. We worship God. I don't think God worships himself. I don't know. That's an interesting question. If glorifying oneself is worship, then maybe he does. I hadn't thought of that. But it, it is to lift up a worthy name. Now, if, if we boast, and, and we boast beyond who we are, We would call that arrogant. Mm -hmm. But if, if God brings glory to himself, he is simply telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Let's wrestle with that one for a while. Mm -hmm. The Father entrusts and authorizes. The last one I want to call attention to at this time is kind of an interesting one, which reminded me a little bit of earthly fathers, mm -hmm. and that is this. The father is a homeowner. Jesus says, do not, in John chapter 14, verses 14 and following, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Jesus says, there is a home in heaven for God's children. And God and Jesus are preparing a place for us. I find that interesting because what do 
guys like to do? Well, they like to fix up their homes. They like to use tools. Now, I know ladies also like to do fix-up projects and things like that, but uh, I see a lot of men in home improvement stores. And there is just something which just seems uh, inherent in men's hearts to want to fix things up and make things as they ought to be. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we see the same as our Heavenly Father. Jesus talks about himself as being the way to the Father. And when the last prayer that Philip prays in John chapter 14, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. If you just have God, if you have God the Father, that's all you need. And how did Jesus answer? Jesus answered, Don't you know, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How could you say to us, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me, who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will be even greater than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Do you agree with me that there is so much richness in this that we learn about God? And could it be that God is calling us to deepen our appreciation for who God is? Even as we are deepening our appreciation for who Jesus is. If we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. And praise God that God came among us in the person of Jesus in a way that we can understand him. And that Jesus lived a human life and was tempted in every way that we have been tempted, and yet he was without sin. And we can go to the Father through Jesus. And we can receive the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who will guide us and counsel us and Comfort us as we are seeking to go to the Father. May God indeed plant these things on our mind. And shall we pray? Our Father, we stand in awe as we open up these words from the Gospel of John. We, we see that it is a, an entirely new kingdom, an entirely new world that is not of this earth. And we thank you for these tiny glimpses that we have seen from what Jesus has revealed to us about the Father. And we thank you, Father, for our Heavenly Fathers who have also loved us and taught us and shared with us and revealed things to us and provided for us. We thank you that you are a good Father and we tr entrust ourselves to Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God for dads. Amen. We can go to our dad, our Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. with any needs. His ear is open. He'll fix it. If we've sinned, he'll forgive it. If we're sick, he'll heal it. Maybe not on this earth, but one day we'll have new bodies, we'll have new eyes, yes. new legs, mm -hmm. new hearts. Yes. Not just physical hearts, but spiritual hearts. Yeah. We will no longer sin, we 
you will no longer experience hunger for a father because we will be with God. He will never leave us or forsake us. As we walk on this earth, we have trials and difficulties, and thankfully we can pray for one another. And thankfully, provision has been made for us to be baptized into Christ. And we can be raised to walk in newness of life as we were baptized into him. Whatever your need may be, please make it known as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Back then to Jesus.